transport service that has sort of gained popularity in various cities um, of South Africa, having started here and spreading out to various parts um, of the country. It's also at an international level. So along with the surge, you know, the, the surge in popularity of Uber, there have also been a lot of questions about um, the fate of workers and how workers fare under under the system, how is it really organized, a lot of questions about who really is behind Uber and all those things. So those questions are, are increasing. But we've also seen um, quite a, a, a lot of work coming out of, especially um, Ground Up and, and some other um, organizations which are starting to bring to light some of the, the inconsistencies, uh, some of the challenges with the system and how People, the people behind the steering wheels are basically faring under, under Uber. So we thought we'd organize this particular seminar. And with us, we've got Ayabonga Gawe, um, who defines himself as a, a left economist. Um, he is an activist um, emerging out of the student movement, the youth movement, um, one of the founders of a young left economist uh, forum, which um, is called Rethink Africa. It used to be called Young Economists for Africa, but it's called Rethink Africa now. But he's also associated with Oxfam South Africa and is a program uh, manager uh, at Oxfam South Africa. During his spare time, he also uh, does photography and um, portraits of working class people and various struggles in cities and urban areas, but also in the in the in the in the countryside, the, the rural areas. So, Aya, without any, uh, any further delays, I'm just going to give to you, um, hand the over, over the platform to you for, for you to take us through, and then we'll have a Q&A &A afterwards, um, some interaction. I also understand that we've got quite a, a dynamic um, audience, aside from people who have been writing and have been capturing the stories of, um, of, the, of the, the people, the workers behind the steering wheel, we also have some of the, of the workers actually present here. So this makes the voices present in the room quite, um, it's going to be a very dynamic session, I believe, and with, with your permission, we'd also like you to just weigh in on some of these um, challenges and give us your perspective as people who are involved directly with what you're talking about, about today. So, Aya? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Comrade Pindula. I think I would rather stand, because uh, I think if, you, if I sit there, I'll probably become very tired uh, of just sitting there. But, um, pardon? I think so too. Um, I was actually saying earlier on to, to Paula and uh, Comrade Pindler when I got here that it's interesting, I, I've been invited to come and speak about Uber. Um, and when Zanele sort of were organizing the logistics of coming here, said, you know, when you get to the airport, give me a call and um, I'll call the Uber for you to come and fetch you. Um, so I think for me, that was a big reminder that we, we, we don't live in a vacuum. And I think that a lot of the things that I'm going to speak about here are things that people experience, not only as workers, but also it's something that we as people who are consumers of that particular service must be able to, to, to grapple with. So I've titled the, the discussion Uber and the sharing economy. Um, is it the sharing of wealth or is it the sharing of exploitation? Just wanted to start off with a few quotes there. So, you know, is it new age convenience? Is it new forms of exploitation? What, is it, what does it necessarily mean? And I thought it might be helpful for us to start with sort of um, the views and the perspectives of people whose lived experience it is to work um, for a sort of a tech-like multinational such as Uber. And the first one there is an Uber driver from Los Angeles who chose not to be uh, sort of named. And he says, Uber takes 20% of my earnings. They treat me like shit. They cut prices whenever they want. They can deactivate me whenever they feel like it. And if I complain, they tell me to fuck off. The second one is someone called John Shehab, uh, who's an Uber driver from San Francisco. And they have a particularly different perspective, which is, you know, I can make a stronger argument that Uber is, uh, is my employee rather than me being employed by Uber. Uber books my business. Uber collects my money. Uber sends me statements. Uber deposits money in my account. So in the final analysis, really, from John Shehab's perspective, Uber is her employee and not necessarily the other way around. And that's a different perspective to the, to the first one that we had. And then I think one of the other perspectives that are gonna come through in a sort of short two minute video that, um, that, uh, that I've put together is um, 
of a guy who calls himself Bin Laden and who's a meter taxi driver. So he doesn't necessarily work for Uber, but he's on the other end of the scale, uh, working from uh, the west of Johannesburg in a place called Cresta. Uh, and he says, they're just using our people for Mahala. They make us fight among ourselves. And this is the colonial economy, and we don't want it. So what is Uber? Uh, Uber was founded in 2009 by Travis Kalanick, who is a sort of a fire and brimstone, very sort of burly, very disruptive, very, um, I won't call him innovative, digital entrepreneur, but um, he's probably started a few sort of tech startups and he's sold a lot of them and he's made a lot of money from that. But what Uber in essence does is that it links drivers with work, right? So it links those who need a, a lift or who need sort of a, a ride somewhere. And through the app, they overcome, as they say, some of the information challenges. So who's going to pick me up? What car are they driving? Um, what, what am I likely to pay? So there's a, a, a functionality on the app which is, sort of gives you a fair estimate. So if I'm going to be traveling from here to C point, it gives me a sense of the range of that cost. Um, but also, in effect, what it is is that it's a software application which just links drivers uh, with customers. And for that particular service, or for that value that they've added, they actually take 20% commission. But as we'll see later on, their power doesn't only end with that 20% commission. Um, and in six years, since 2009, uh, I would say close to seven now, Uber has gone, up, has gone from a startup that was based in Silicon Valley to a multinational which is present in 250 cities and 53 countries across the globe. Um, by 2015, they had a valuation that was higher than General Motors. And if you think about it, Uber doesn't even own one car. And yet General Motors, uh, sort of one of the Detroit's pride, uh, has probably one of been, uh, over the last sort of century or so, been one of the biggest auto manufacturers in the world, and yet their valuation um, is nowhere near what Uber is. So, and so in essence, what Uber is, is part of is something called the on-demand or sharing economy, which re refers to sort of peer-to-peer, access-driven kind of businesses. And what it is, it says, you know, unlike what we had in the 20th century, where if you wanted to access a particular service or a product, you first had to pay for ownership of it before you could use it. What they do now is, is that you don't necessarily have to own it. You can actually have a piece of that and be able to use it without actually owning the underlying asset. Now, that's interesting because I think it comes with a lot of problems in that Uber can take 20% of that surplus, if we, if we see it in those terms, uh, without actually having to own the underlying asset, actually having to take on the risks of owning the underlying asset. Now, if any of us own a car, you know what I mean by those risks. Services, insurance, installments, tires, petrol, and a range of other things. But a lot of these businesses are not only confined to the auto sector. There's a lot of businesses that are in sort of the hospitality and accommodation space, so Airbnb, couch surfing. Um, there's also in the United States um, a service that sort of links people who have micro skills to work, and that's called TaskRabbit. So it's sort of a freelancing site. Um, and then, of course, you have, from an entertainment perspective, things like Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, where you don't necessarily have to buy you know, the, the content. You can actually access it for a fee, um, and that fee is sort of charged periodically, depending on whether you charge it weekly, monthly, um, or sort of bi-monthly. But what is the role of workers in this model? So workers in the Uber model are referred to as partner drivers or sort of independent contractors, uh, which sort of tends to be the buzzword when people don't really want to have the sort of, uh, how do I say it, the, some of the conditions that are associated with an employer-employee relationship. Um, and also what Uber has done is that it's used as clout and the big backing that it has from major sort of venture equity firms to really redefine and reclassify what a worker is. Uh, so what they've done is they've said, look, their relationship is not one of the people that are working being employees, but it's actually partners. So the partnership across the board uh, really requires them to take a 20% cut of everyone who joins the platform. Um, and if you really think about it, there's a particular kind of power inherent in this relationship, which you would find in an employer-employee relationship which they you know, mask and, very, and, and cover in very sort of interesting ways. And so the first question of power is actually around your ability to be on the platform. So you first have to apply to be on the platform. Um, and there's certain things that you need to do to be on that platform. So your car needs to be um, sort of a, of a certain age, a certain mileage. Um, you need to sort of, they do the screenings, they do all of those checks. 
Um, but also, there's certain things that if you do, they have the power to deactivate you off the platform. So it's not necessarily just about matching, because if it was about matching, uh, all they would be doing, just like eBay, would be to say, look, you can put up your business on our site and we'll just link you. Um, and we have no power over whether or not you are still able to be on the platform, uh, depending on however you perform. There's also the question of fair setting. So in Johannesburg, earlier on this year, for instance, uh, they unilaterally cut, slash the, the fees. Um, and of course, what they do is that they also have something called surge pricing. So they then decide as the app owner that you know, when we see it's peak time now, um, let's see how much money we can actually make. And they have surge pricing. But also alongside that, they also have uh, sort of a unilateral sense of when they can cut fees across the board. Um, and of course, that has an impact on the person who owns the underlying asset. Because it means in as much as you can push as much volumes as you want, but you won't be able to get the same returns that you were getting before. And there's an interesting quote in one of the other slides that, uh, from, from one of the drivers in the US. And they explain how sort of that sort of lower price, higher demand, more volume model doesn't necessarily work in this space. But also, what is the benefit um, for Uber in defining this relationship in the way that they have and in misclassifying that relationship? Well, firstly, they get to avoid uh, compliance with labor laws. They get to avoid paying out benefits to workers. Um, but also, they get to avoid the risks that are associated with the underlying asset. Servicing of cars, insurance costs, and even the depreciation that's associated with the, with the underlying asset. Right? The moment you take a car out of the dealership, it's already started depreciating. However, Uber takes that 20% and doesn't even factor in, even in the fair setting, that at some point you're actually going to have to sell the car at whatever carrying cost that you have, um, and it will have depreciated, and no one actually compensates you for that cost. So where is the exploitation? Who owns the underlying asset, and why does it matter? And I, I, I've sort of spoken briefly about this, but I think it's really important because in many instances, what we're finding is a lot of people are getting into long-term debt uh, because there's a very interesting relationship between some of the car manufacturers and Uber that allows for people to get into debt to own the underlying asset, while Uber gets to have more cars on the road, which means more 20% commission pieces across the, you know, the, the, the road without actually engaging with what that necessarily means for the people who are their partner drivers or their independent contractors. There's also the question around flexibility, and what they've done is, is to say, you know, Uber is, is, is good because if you are having another job, uh, you can work over sort of the, the weekends and get some money and you can save up for a holiday, and they really sort of frame it in aspirational ways. But if you really think about it, if fares are cut unilaterally, that flexibility means I could initially work three hours for the same amount of money, but for me to get the same amount of money once they've slashed fee, uh, fares, I actually have to work for about eight hours or so. Now imagine that for people who are full-time Uber drivers and what that necessarily means. And there was an interesting story by GroundUp um, a few weeks, well, actually about a month ago, where they actually spoke about some of the numbers behind this. And I think it's, a, it's an interesting, I don't know, Pindi, if, you, if, you, if that article was shared. But I think the root of a lot of this exploitation comes from a myth that is in sort of the neoclassical economics framework. Um, and, I, and I always use whatever opportunity I have to critique neoclassical economics as someone who was sort of trained or mistrained as an economist. But it's, um, it's, it's the logic that says, look, lower prices will lead to greater demand. And of course, greater demand will lead to greater volumes. And then greater volumes, of course, is going to lead to greater takings for not only Uber, but also for the partner driver. But it's not true, because if you think about it, Uber takes that 20% without the underlying risks, but also the person who's actually doing the work, not only risking with the car, but also risking with their lives by sort of working Herculean hours, um, is not a machine. And I think we need to be really clear about that. And, uh, and Palmer here, who's one of the sort of Uber drivers in, uh, in San Diego, says, you know, how do you justify this 30% cut in fees? You know, and they said, well, since we've dropped the price, we're going to have more customers. And he says, well, I'm not selling apples. I'm not selling donuts. I'm driving a car. Um, I can do 15 or 16 rides a night, and that's where it ends. And if the price is 30% 30, 30 less, it means of those 15 and 16 rides, I'm going to have 30% less. 
It doesn't mean because the price is lower now I can go and do 22 rides because I'm not a machine. And I think this is where for me it's a very good example of where sort of neoclassical economic ideas and sort of assumptions um, are probably not borne out in reality but also have a very anti-work and anti-human perspective. So it's not just about the stuff that's in the books or the policies that come from that stuff but it's also the impact that it has on human lives. And the danger that not only will visit the driver, but also the danger that's likely to visit the customers. And uh, frankly, I mean, Uber's sitting in San Francisco and probably is getting their 20%, um, and is far removed from that situation. But also, I think in, in, in the conversations that I had an opportunity to have, um, with some of the sort of meter taxi drivers. So, so you remember that in Santon, um, a few, about a month ago, there was a big sort of furor around meter taxi drivers and Uber. Um, and it really at some point became very violent with sort of cars getting stoned. And, I, and um, I'm aware that similar things have happened here in the city here in Cape Town. But I then took the opportunity to say, look, from all the stories that we were reading, the perspective was always coming from Uber's side or from Uber drivers, who were very sort of sympathetic to, to the Uber model and felt that you know, the meter taxi drivers were just hooligans who just wanted to take them out of business. And we really felt that you know, that wasn't the entire part of the story. There must have been an underlying story behind it. How did the industry work before the disruptors, and I use that inverted commas because I think it's not necessarily disruptive innovation. I think it's exploitative innovation. But how did they do it? And I think there's two aspects to it. The first one is really uncompetitive price behavior. And the second one is around regulatory avoidance. So let me quickly just discuss these in turn. I think the first one relates to the unilateral price setting. So what they do is that they're willing to slash prices in order for them to get a higher market share in the spaces that they work in. Um, and of course, this happens alongside other measures, such as introducing cash in lieu of sort of credit cards, so that you're able to capture a market that doesn't necessarily have the credit cards but would need your service, and you're able to provide it at a lower charge, but the question then becomes at whose cost? And then, of course, there's the question of the regulations. So the Department of Transport has sort of schedules around what is the regulated price for the meter taxi industry. Um, and some of the drivers are telling us that it's 12 rand 50 a kilometer, and that's the regulated price. And if we think about Uber, and uh, sort of when I put these numbers together, it was about a month ago, and I don't necessarily think they've changed in Johannesburg. I mean, I stand to, corre I stand to be corrected. But it was six rand a kilometer and 30 cents, oh, sorry, 60 cents a minute. Now, that's less than half of the regulated price. But then we ask ourselves, what is the political economy of the remaining 80%, right? So Uber takes us 20%. But what is the distribution of the remaining 80%? And the assumption, whenever you know you hear the spokespeople from Uber, well, these are our partner drivers, these are independent contractors. Well, in most cases, the people that drive the cars don't necessarily own the cars. It's someone else who owns the car who then hires a driver. And of course, they then negotiate uh, who gets a piece of what in the remaining 80%. And that's never uniform. And it's always sort of subject to whatever that relationship is. Then there's also the question of the role and function of the technology. So we can't necessarily dispute that the technology has changed the way in which the, the industry functions. Um, and also, it's been a big value add for a lot of consumers now, especially young consumers who are more sort of adept to using technology and uh, find it much more comfortable to use, to use the technology. And so one of the other meter taxi drivers I got a chance to speak to in Cresta said, Whenever you go and apply for a permit at the department, you need to have your starting point. Uber doesn't have a starting point. Our people don't get permits there because they don't have a starting point. But at some point, Uber was getting permits in Johannesburg. And I heard from an Uber driver here in Cape Town last weekend that there was a big furor, I think the previous weekend, um, with uh, Uber cars being impounded because they didn't have permits. So I think it's clear that there are sort of regulatory differences across uh, places and, um, and I think one of the main issues there is that issue of the permits. How do you go into a sector um, as sort of renegades that are not willing to comply to that sector because firstly you don't agree with how that sector is regulated 
But also what then becomes the role of the regulator, which I think in this instance have really found themselves flat-footed. So there's been a mixed response from regulators to say, look, should we regulate these guys heavily in the same way that we've regulated the industry, or should we actually change the regulations themselves? And you can imagine that Uber's probably been pushing for the latter, that you know, regulations must be changed in a way that allows them to work better. And if you listen to what Kalanick has said, I mean, in America about two years ago, he said, if you placed the black cab meter industry in the, in the US next to Uber in a political election, you probably would have them winning because he felt that they were so entrenched in the system in the United States. Now, I don't know if that's the case here in South Africa, but I do think there are some really relevant issues that the meter taxi industry is raising, uh, and we'll see now in the video uh, what, what some of those things speak to. There's also something in the taxi industry which is called binding. Um, and it's more prevalent in sort of the minibus taxi industry where you sort of, there's a place where you collect passengers and there's a place where you then come back once you've dropped those people. Whereas Uber doesn't have that. So you could drop someone off at the Khao train station in Rosebank, and just after you've dropped that person off, have another pickup. And so those volumes, if we think about them, of course are going to have a detrimental impact on the amount of trips that the metered taxi industry has because of how they've necessarily been structured. Where there's a queue system, there's an entire orderly structure of how you need to start, uh, where you need to bind, and how many trips you can take, and, and, and that kind of thing. With the instrument of our liberation, no, we fell in love with the instrument of our liberation. The uh, struggle continues. The, uh, but they came to South Africa to capture us, our injustice. They hijacked our injustice, and that's what we don't want. Um, yeah, when they came here, they should have uh, came to us and then negotiate with us. Within us, meter taxis and Uber. Interesting, I solve a good go here. If I know what you say, Uber, the meter taxis. If one of us is able to go to the bus, seven the night. Seven is on the same system. If our price is 50 rand, then it will be 50 rand. If the price is maybe like a kilometer, it's 12 rand 50, which will be 12 rand 50. I wonder what is the difference between the Zobo and the Internet now. What is the 50-50? Technology is 100%. We want it. But now the government should come in and assist our people. Because they're charging very less, less, less. less. Yeah, yeah, and they, maybe you can find the difference of uh, under rand in our prices. So it's not good. Whenever you go to apply the permit there, you need to have your starting point. Uber doesn't have a starting point. Our people can't get a permit there at the port because they don't have a starting point. But why Uber is getting a permit whereas they don't have that starting point? So they're just using our people for Mahala. You know what I mean? Mm. And about Tindezena, so it's our rail, we're in ourselves. As you remember, it was each and every section, you had to meet around Johannesburg. That's why we're going to fight tomorrow. Little tag 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 but when if that's where they, they, will, they will see our faces. So, I mean, what has been the response globally? Because I think it's clear to all of us that there's, these are similar issues that people find across the, the board, right? In all of the 53 countries across the globe where Uber has a presence, there's been a lot of resistance from not only people that work for Uber internally, but also the existing industry in those countries. So in Italy and Spain, for instance, policymakers in the existing industry question the legality of Uber and the relationship between the company and its partner drivers. Was it an employer-employee relationship? Or was it a typical sort of commercial partnership? And what did that necessarily mean? And we've spoken earlier on about some of the things that don't necessarily make it a typical commercial partnership uh, because of the power dynamics that are, that are underlying that relationship. In Paris, um, Uber drivers have had their windows smashed and their tires slashed. In South Korea, the government brought criminal charges against Kalanik, who's the founder, and 28 others for running an unlicensed taxi service. 
here in South Africa, more notably in Cape Town and Johannesburg, and I anticipate the same to happen in Port Elizabeth and Durban as well. Um, there's been a strong resistance to Uber's presence, um, and a lot of it has come from the established meter taxi industry, with uh, the regulators really sort of taking a back seat in that, in that debate. And then in Seattle, some workers have come together to form an app drivers association. And one of the reasons for that is because if you are found to be unionizing Uber, you are deactivated. It's one of the power relationships. So they encourage you not to organize as people that work for Uber because you are independent contractors. So they want you to be atomized and be sort of one, 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 rather than come together because then if you come together, then they can't have the unilateral fair setting and they can't really have the kind of power that allows them to have a relationship that they sort of mask as a partnership, but which is a typical sort of, in many instances, exploitative employer-employee relationship. However, I think challenges remain not only here in South Africa, but across the globe around coherent regulatory responses, not only to Uber, but to companies in the sharing economy as a whole and in the on-demand economy. And this is not necessarily from just the regulatory perspective, but also from a tax perspective. I mean, if I think about Airbnb or if I think about sort of couch surfing, um, how much of that and the inflow into that part of the sharing economy actually goes unnoticed by the receiver of revenue? Um, and I think in as much as a lot of these models are disruptive and make us think really clearly about how industry is going to be undertaken in the 21st century in a very digitized form, there's also a need for us to really um, factor in how we can really protect the people who, in essence, are sort of the backbone of that industry. And those are the owners of the underlying assets. Or the people who are at the coal face of actually using the asset that, you know, has to sweat to get, to get the money in. And, and just lastly, I think, on the question of sort of us sitting here, what can we do as, as consumers who um, sort of use Uber, um, I think I was saying to, to, to Pindi earlier on, there's a big difficulty in South Africa that we, I mean, since I think the, the end of the struggle, in many ways, we haven't built some kind of consumer-driven organizing. Um, so you don't see the consumer boycotts. You don't see the sort of conscientization around what it is we engage with and what we consume. Um, and it's not only around Uber. I mean, if I think about what was happening around the Agoa issue with some of the sort of poultry coming from the United States, one would have expected that there would have been some kind of sort of accompanying response from organized consumers. And I think we, it's an indication that we're still living in a society where you know, neoliberalism has sort of created the conditions that enable individualized responses to issues um, rather than collective responses that are able to really confront power in meaningful and valuable ways. So I'll leave it there, and I really look forward to the conversation. And, and once again, thank you very much for having me.